Uh, so real quick, before we get started, I um, just wanted to give the, the, uh, the organizers, if we could, a real quick round of a standing ovation, because seriously, I mean, Speaking of impossible things, somehow this is the first conference they've organized, and the, the number of times I've had my mind blown throughout the day, I just keep saying like, sure glad I don't have to follow that talk, sure glad I don't have to follow that talk, and then like Murphy was my last hope, and then of course his was mind blowing too, so really there's just, <laughs> the, the quality level here has just been unbelievable, and I am so thrilled to be a part of this community, and just like, everybody here is amazing. Um, so this last talk, uh, it's the last talk of the day, and uh, this is gonna be a little bit more chill. We don't have like a crazy demo. Um, hopefully though, this is gonna be something practical, something where you can walk away with less of a whoa and more of a ah. So that's what we're going for here. Making impossible states impossible. So um, I, I'd like to start off by just sort of establishing, I, I think this is just a good rule for any speaker really, is just establishing that the speaker is a reasonable, sensible person. Uh, so, of course, I want to talk about the CSS preprocessor I decided to make. Um, <laughs> best way to demonstrate that. Um, so, Elm CSS, uh, if you're not familiar with it, we saw a very tiny bit of it uh, with Jessica's talk earlier. Uh, but the basic idea is that you write Elm code uh, in, in order to generate either a CSS file or inline styles, things like that. And it's designed to look sort of like a CSS file might look. So you have body, uh, except instead of that being a CSS declaration, it's going to be an Elm function call that's going to compile to a CSS declaration. Got some properties underneath it, padding, min width, overflow x, things like that. And uh, one of the goals of Elm CSS is to only generate valid style sheets. We want to make sure that if we're going to be generating this CSS, it's something valid, something that the browser will accept. And if it's not possible to generate that, then we should give you an error, either at compile time or there's a validation step, things like that. Um, so the CSS spec is something that I've gotten a lot more familiar with in the course of uh, this undertaking. And um, believe it or not, there are a lot of ways to generate invalid style sheets. There are actually, there are actually a ton of them. And uh, one of the ones that surprised me most was when I was going through the section on at rules. So uh, at rules include things like at media, at font face, other things that start with at symbols, hence the name. And um, the three in particular that, that surprised me the most were at char set, at import, and at namespace. Quick show of hands, how many people have used all three of these? Okay, so this is safe to say a dusty corner of the spec. So let's just go over the, uh, some real quick rules. There might be some surprises in here. So char set must be the first character of your style sheet and multiples are disallowed. By the first character, what I mean is if you say at char set and there is so much as a new line in front of that invalid style sheet right there, it's gotta be the very first character of your style sheet and you can't declare more than one at once. Uh, import must be done before any at namespace declarations and also before any uh, style declarations. But of course it has to be after char set because char set can only be the first character. So if you got a char set, gotta be first, then import, and then uh, namespace has to be after import, which has to be after char set, but before any style declarations. So all of these rules uh, put together mean that this is thankfully a valid style sheet. So we've got char set first, very first character of the style sheet, a couple of imports, a couple of namespaces, and then uh, your style declarations would all go after that. But the important thing is that according to the spec, these things have to be grouped this way. That's the only way to get a valid CSS style sheet that actually uses all these. So here is sort of the, my first intuition for how I would port this into Elm CSS. I've been going with this theme of like, it should sort of look like and feel like uh, writing a normal style sheet. So I'd sort of just get rid of the at signs and just uh, instead just have function calls. So you have char set, import, okay, import's a reserved keyword in Elm, so I can't just name the function import. I got a little underscore in there to work around that. Namespace, no problem, and then body as the first of your styles and just go on from there. Okay, cool, uh, but if you look at this and you think about the types here, these all have to be the same type because they're in a list. So in this case, these would be declarations, which implies that if you want, you could shuffle these all around. You could write your style first and then alternate between namespace and import and then have two char sets at the end. You could write that and it would compile. But our goal is to only generate valid style sheets. This, if we translate it sort of naively from what the user has written into a CSS file is not going to be a valid style sheet. This is breaking actually all of the rules that we just covered, literal all. Um, 
Okay, so uh, then I was like, oh, well, I, I have this problem. I will come up with a solution for it. And the solution I came up with was validate and sort. So first of all, give a validation error if there are multiple char sets. I mean, there's no getting around that. If you define multiple char sets, it's gonna compile, because they're both declarations, but I can at least in the validation step say, hey, sorry, this is not a valid style sheet. And then for sorting, I can just sort of fix the out of ordering problems. I can just say, oh, well, I'll just put char set first when I'm spitting it out, and then I'll emit the import, and then emit the namespace, and then emit the styles, and uh, we're all good. Obviously, uh, I then need to write a ton of tests for this because there are so many different ways in which you could get this wrong. You could have uh, import and, and namespace interchange like that. You could have multiple char sets. I mean, just all over the place, all sorts of problems you could have. Um, so then, uh, after coming up with this plan of attack, I thought I would run this design um, by one of my coworkers who's better at making APIs than I am. Um, his name's Evan. Um, if you'd like to work with us, by the way, we're hiring. Um, and, uh, and essentially, he gave me a really interesting piece of advice that uh, was sort of a perspective I hadn't really considered here, which was, uh, what if you just make representing invalid style sheets impossible? Like, what if you just made it so the data model actually can't hold on to an invalid style sheet like that. It's like, huh. So put another way, it's kind of like, okay, so I've been representing these things as just this list of declarations, but like, who says that's the best data model? CSS? Like, I'm, I'm gonna do this just because CSS did it? If CSS told me to jump off a bridge, what I do, well, probably I'd get the positioning wrong, I'd forget to clear a float, so like the bridge would not be able to, <laughs> anyway. Um, but the point is like, is that the best data model to represent this, given all these rules that I know about? Probably not. So we kind of talked about it, and where we ended up with uh, was this. So essentially, hey, char set, what if that were just a separate thing and it were just a maybe string, right? You can have zero or one char sets. That's, that's one of the rules. So maybe it's pretty good for that. You can have zero or one things there. Makes sense. Um, imports and namespaces and declarations cannot be intermingled. You can't alternate between them. They have to be one contiguous chunk, one contiguous chunk, one contiguous chunk. So why would they be the same type? Actually, having them be the same type is like an anti-feature. Um, you would much rather have them be incompatible types so that you can't actually represent having them intermingled. It's not possible. It wouldn't type check. So having them be different things like this means that now generating a valid style sheet is a piece of cake. We just go through and say, hey, char set. Is there a nothing? Okay, do nothing. Is there a just? Great, that's the first character of our style sheet. Imports, great, just list them. Namespaces, list them. Declarations, list them. Done, that's gonna be valid. It's gonna satisfy all of those rules every time. In other words, this code right here, this problematic thing, which if I naively generated it, just doesn't compile anymore. Which means that there's a lot less to test because there's a lot less that can go wrong. In fact, if I actually tried to write a test for that code, the test wouldn't compile. So one of my interesting takeaways from this is like, you know, tests are good, tests are good but impossible is better. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> if I can't even test it, then awesome. I don't have even less to worry about. Um, another thing that surprised me was that a clearer data model can actually lead to a clearer API. Like one of the things that was confusing about that broken example was that it kind of looked fine. Like if I read through it, I'm like, oh yeah, these, these like look pretty familiar to me. But actually they were just broken in really non-obvious ways. So if you end up with a different API that sort of forces you to call things and pass things in a certain way, it can sort of suggest to you as the user of that API the proper way to represent your data, the proper way to implement things that will lead to a valid style sheet on the other side. So then the next logical question is, hmm, can we use this approach in applications? In other words, uh, what if we're not dealing with a library like Elm CSS? Can we just make impossible model states impossible to represent? What might that get us? So I'm just gonna walk through a quick example here. Um, a survey app. So we just have prompts and responses. So essentially we're talking about a series of things where you got a prompt, something like, what was the best part about ElmConf, and then just a little text field for a response. We'll just have a series of those right in a row, asking the user questions and then gathering their responses as a text input. So this might be a model that we might use to represent this. We just have a list of prompts and then a list of responses, which are gonna be maybe strings because the user may or may not have entered them yet. And as they go through and respond, those will go from a series of nothings to a series of justs until you're all done, you've worked your way through all the prompts. So this is one way we could do it. Uh, we could look at this and, and we could write something out like uh, that would satisfy this. So uh, here would be some prompts. Uh, first, what is your favorite ElmConf memory? Second, is this the real life? Third, is this just fantasy? Caught in, okay, anyway. Um, so uh, responses might include uh, all the crowd surfers. Weren't they amazing? I, I really enjoyed the crowd surfers earlier. Um, so that would be the first response, favorite ElmConf memory. Uh, and then nothing, nothing, because I haven't answered the other two questions yet. So this would be our model. But 
there's a problem with this model. This right here is a completely invalid state. We have no prompts whatsoever, and yet the user has responded, yes. What does that mean? This should be impossible. If, this ever, if we ever end up in this model state, that means we had some business logic that broke somehow. Not exactly clear on how, but somehow something went wrong. So if this should be impossible, why should we permit it? Why, why should we allow this impossible state? It seems like it would be better if we could make this impossible such that when we write the code that leads to this state, we get a compiler error, so the compiler is telling us, oh, um, maybe you should think a little bit harder about this. It seems like this is going to do a bad thing. Because otherwise, we're gonna end up debugging this, working backwards, stepping through to try and figure out how it got in this state. Much better to find out up front at compile time that you wrote something that's not going to make sense. So, can we make this actually impossible? Sure, here's a very straightforward way to do that. So instead of having two lists, we just have two fields inside a record and make a list of those. So now we have one response per prompt. You actually cannot have a prompt without a corresponding response. You cannot have a response without a corresponding prompt. They just go together, which makes sense because these are coupled. Every single prompt is supposed to have a response. Cool. Okay, so that was pretty easy. Let's, let's uh, make it a little bit fancier. So let's say we want to add question navigation. This is a new feature for our survey app. So we want to be able to go forward and to go back. So instead of just answering the question sequentially, maybe you can say, oh, you know what? I want to skip this one. Uh, this one's kind of hard, tricky. Uh, I'll come back to it later. Or maybe you say, oh, I just realized I want to go back and edit one of my previous answers. So navigating back and forth through these questions. Okay, so we might uh, pull out at this point the history from our model, because maybe our model's got some other stuff going on in it. And we'd say, okay, we're just gonna focus on the history portion of this. And now we have a new piece of information. So we've got a list of questions, just like before, each one with the, the, both the response and the prompt. But additionally, we also have the current question that we're just going to keep track of. And we can move that back and forth to indicate where you are, which current question you are within the list of all the questions. So here's an example. Let's say we've got some pastry-related survey. Uh, so we've got a list of questions. We've got a cake-related question, a pie-related question, some cookies-related questions, and the current one is pie, indicating that we are in the middle of that series of questions, and the current one that's going to be displayed to the user is the one about pie. Okay, cool. Um, here's a state that should be impossible that this current data model permits. We have no questions whatsoever, and yet, somehow the user is answering some mysterious pie-related question. How did we end up here? Once again, this is some mystery bug. We're going to have to figure out how things got in this state. Wouldn't it be better if we could make it impossible? Just say, that we, we can't have zero questions. That a survey with zero questions is useless. Uh, make sure that we have at least one question in the survey if we're going to have the user be able to interact with it. So here's a quick way to do that. Uh, switch from having questions be a list of questions to having it be the first question, which stands alone, and then the other questions, which is a list. So you can conceptualize this as what you do in a pattern match when you're splitting up a list. You say, oh, we have to have at least a first thing. That's gotta be a question. No matter what, we need to have at least one of those. That's mandatory. Uh, but then we also might have some more after that. So you can also think about this in terms of how you would get back to the original data model, which is to say, cons the first one onto the others. That would give you one contiguous list, but importantly, in terms of the data model, you always have at least one. So, uh, the way that this would translate into our actual model is we would have first, which is just a question, and then others, which is a list of questions, with their powers combined. They give us um, Captain Plan uh, so, some, some sort of list of questions, and then we still have the, the current question down below. Cool, so now, uh, using our previous example, we can say uh, first equals cake, others equals pie and cookies. So this is essentially the same list of three questions. So cake is the first question, pie is the second question, cookies is the third question, and we are currently on pie. Importantly, having zero questions is now impossible. Okay, but what if the current question is not one of the available questions? That's another bug we can currently have with this data model. Right, what about this? So the first one's cake, second one's pie, third one's cookies, but the current one is ice cream, which is not one of our questions. We don't have that anywhere in our list. So the user's on it, they're about to answer it, and once they've answered it, who knows what's gonna happen? Again, this should be impossible. Can we make it impossible? Yes, we can, by using what's called a zip list. So I'm gonna channel Tessa Kelly here and introduce a new data structure. So the basic idea here is that we store three things. We store all the previous questions, we store the current question, and then we store the remaining questions. So here's an example of how this might look. So we'd say previous, we're gonna have cake and pie, so that's question one and question two. 
Question three is going to be cookies, which is the current question. And then question four is going to be ice cream, which is the remaining one. Now, in order to put this together, we would do previous, and then the current, and then the remaining. Just stick all those together, and that would give us our master list of everything. So, importantly, having a current question that is not an available question is now impossible. There's no way to represent that. And we can demonstrate this by demonstrating how also it's impossible to have zero questions. If worse comes to worst, if this is sort of as empty as it possibly can get, that means we have nothing in the previous space, we have nothing in the remaining space, we still have current, and in fact, current lines up with something in our list, because current is expressed in terms of part of our list. So now we've made it completely impossible to end up with any of those invalid states that we had earlier. Sweet. Okay, but let's talk about the upgrade experience, which is burrito-related in ways we will later see. <laughs> it's actually not. <laughs> I just like pictures of cats. There's nothing deep here. Um, Okay, so the upgrade experience. So here are sort of the, the essential elements of our current API. So we've got this history record, which the user can access in order to read things off of it and maybe render the current history. And then uh, we've got a couple of different things that we want to be able to do. We want to be able to say, go back in history. So it takes a history and then just steps it back one, moves current back a position. Forward does the opposite, moves current forward a position. Answer, for when the user types in their answer and you know, hits submit, we need to record that, change the, uh, the maybe to adjust. Um, and finally, in it, something to just say, hey, here's the, uh, the current one that's going to be the first one in the list, and here's any remaining ones, and then just generate for me a history based on that. Okay, so far so good. These are sort of the essential elements. Okay, here's the problem, though. When we upgraded our internal representation and made it more robust, in the process of doing that, we actually changed the structure of our record. We removed that questions field and replaced it with previous and remaining. We went from this list plus current value to a zip list, which is more reliable, but it's still different. So what if we had some code that used this? It was actually referencing history.questions directly. Like, what if our existing code is doing this? Well. In that case, it's going to be a breaking change. It's going to break that code, because dot questions does not exist anymore. It's not a thing. OK. But the thing is, like, ideally, everything will continue to work the same way, just with the more robust internal implementation. right? I mean, all we're trying to do here is just make things better under the hood. There's no real reason that this needed to be a breaking change. So can we make it so that depending on certain implementation details is impossible? Can we make it so that anyone who's using our API doesn't have to worry about getting broken when we upgrade? Yeah, we totally can. So uh, here's a great technique for doing that. Just make a single constructor union type instead of a type alias. So this is basically the same thing as what we had before, except instead of type alias history, we're just saying type history equals, and then we're giving it just one constructor called history. Um, and in, inside of that is the record that we had before. The same thing, the zip list, previous, current, remaining. So all we're doing is just wrapping it in a union type that has one constructor. Now, this does mean that working with this thing takes a little bit more effort. So for example, when we're implementing back, now we have to start off by destructuring the data back out of that history. So one way we could do this is with a case. Uh, so it's a case history of, and then there's only one pattern to match on because it's only got one constructor. And while we're at it, we can uh, additionally pattern match on the, uh, the contents of that record to pull those out. Okay, cool. Now we can work with it. We can implement back. Okay, cool. Um, FYI, there's a simpler way to do this, or, or I guess a more concise way, which is actually if you have a union type with just one constructor, you can destructure right there in the argument, just like bam, history, previous, current, remaining, done. So if you're going to use this technique, I recommend doing it this way. It tends to be pretty nice. OK, so then up at the top of our file, if we can imagine this theoretical file that we've written here, um, we're going to be exposing, most likely, history and its constructors. So that's that history and then in parentheses dot dot, saying not only expose the history type, but also expose history's all of its constructors, which in this case is an entire uh, pantheon of one constructor. OK. So we're exposing history and we're exposing its constructors, which means that people who are using our API uh, can access both of those. But what if, instead, we just didn't do that last part? What if we exposed history the type so people can use it in type annotations, but we did not expose history the constructor? We didn't expose any constructors whatsoever. We just said, okay, here's the history type. If you want to write out a type annotation that includes history, go for it, have at it, no problem. But if you want access to what's inside there, if you want to pattern match on it, you want to run a case expression on it, um, sorry, but you can't. You don't have access to that. Internal to our own module, we can always do that because we've defined it right here in our own module. But other modules, no, I'm, I'm afraid they're just not going to have access to that. Okay, 
But then, like, how do they do the equivalent of history.questions? How do they get, I don't know why this is a picture of a, anyway. I don't know, how do you get access to questions? How do you figure out what's inside of there if we have not given you direct access like you had before? And the answer is we can just expose specific functions that let them access data in a way where we now have control over the upgrade experience. So remember back in the day, we said history.questions. We say, oh, cool, here is uh, the history. Um, uh, give me the history and I will give you back a list of questions. Uh, ask, give me uh, the, uh, the current, uh, Give me the history and ask me for the current question, I will give you back the current question. Now with either of the internal representations that we've done, we can implement this function. And actually, if you think about it, on the upgrade path, this is a little bit nicer. Because this way, it's gonna be a lot more common to want to get that list of questions in order to render all of them, or to render links to all of them, things like that. Having to work with the zip list is probably going to be an inconvenience for the end user. What they'd rather get is something simple like this. Internally, it's important for it to be a zip list so that we can prevent any bad states from happening. But as far as the API consumer is concerned, doesn't need to be a problem. But now by exposing these, we can make it so that when there's a new implementation under the hood, there are no breaking changes. Nice, so the upgrade experience is better, but the end user doesn't have to know that we improve things under the hood. Okay, one last thing to add. So let's add a status bar to this thing. So what do I mean by a status bar? What I mean is like when you're editing one of these surveys, up at the top after you make a question, it's like, hey, question created. Cool, and there's a trumpet. Um, so here's uh, how we might introduce this to our model. So we'll pretend we have the other history stuff going on in the model somewhere below. Let's just focus on the status part. So status would be a maybe string. So if it's nothing, don't display anything. If there's just a string in there, then display a little yellow bar probably that says, hey, uh, you created something, good job. Okay. Uh, you might also want to use this for question deleted. Let's say you delete a question. We want to say, oh, uh, well done, you've deleted this question. But it's, uh, it's a pretty nice modern convenience when you delete something to include in the status message like an undo button so you can uh, get it back. You say, oh, whoops, I misclicked. Uh, give me that back, please. But if we want to offer this functionality, if we want to have the undo button in addition to the status message, um, we need somehow to know what to undo to. We need to store the survey question that they just deleted so we can put it back if they want to. So here's one way we could do that. We could start with our status, that's a maybe string, and then we could introduce a question to restore, which is a maybe question that will store the, the information to restore. So here's an example of just question created. So you'd say status equals just question created. So that's no problem. There's nothing to restore at that point because the user didn't delete anything, so we just leave that at nothing. On the flip side, we might have uh, just question deleted for the status, and then question to restore would be just and then the, the question that they deleted. What about this though? What if status is nothing, but we somehow have something to restore? What does that mean? That seems like, again, something went wrong somewhere. We've, had, we've got a bug in our logic. Um, this should be impossible. How do we fix this? Well, in this case, it's actually pretty straightforward. Just replace our two maybes with one tailored union type that's specific to our domain. It's specific to our application, what we're doing. It's just a very concise way to model all the different possibilities. So it's either no status, or you've just got a text status which holds a string, or you've got a deleted status which has the string that we want to display as well as the question to restore if the user deletes it. So to sum up, some things to consider. Number one, uh, do we want two maybes or do we want a tailored union type? So a lot of the time when I start off with a maybe, it's all well and good, and then my instinct, especially coming from a JavaScript background, is just to add another maybe in there. Very often when I've taken another second to think about it, I'm like, oh, actually, there's gonna be some combination of those two maybes that's not gonna do what I want. It'll actually be better if I switch from one maybe to a union type instead of adding a second maybe. And this gets more and more true as the application gets bigger. Another thing to consider is, do we want two separate lists, like we talked about at the beginning, or do we want one list with two fields per element? So again, if you're thinking about introducing a second list, think about, well, is that the right place for that data, or do we actually want to enrich each element within the existing list that we have to prevent synchronization problems? And finally, can we revise our implementation without breaking users' builds? This is something that you sort of have to think about up front. Once you've exposed the implementation, people are relying on it, it's too late to avoid a breaking change. So this is one of those things that if you want to do a good job with it, it's important to hide things by default and think about this ahead of time when you're releasing your first release. So, if it's possible to represent states that should be impossible, please at least consider making the possible impossible. Thanks very much. <laughs>